Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our town hall, COVID one year later. We will be taking questions at the end of tonight's webinar, so or Facebook event, so you can add your comments in the uh, Facebook Live comments section and we'll get those questions to the appropriate people. To start off, I would like to throw to Mayor Gavin Buckley for a welcome. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight or for actually tuning in to this, this broadcast. Um, October 2020 was the last time the city of Annapolis had an official town hall. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody in the city of Annapolis and, and Anne Arundel County for the way they've conducted themselves through these trying times. Um, uh, there was a time that we never thought we would be wearing masks as part of our daily routine. There were, was a time uh, when we thought, you know, how could you not have people over for dinner? That is absurd. How can you have to, why do you not, why can you not hug your grandma? Um, uh, so many things like this are new to us. We had to learn them uh, on the fly. Uh, we had to open our hearts to the people that were less fortunate than us. And, and I am so proud of, of the way it was handled in, in, in this city and this county. And, and, and as a mayor, I, I, I wanna say thank you. Um, we still have some way to go, um, but, um, but we will get there. And we'll get there because of, of your kindness and, and your dedication to what we, we, we've had to do. And I thank you. And we'll hear a welcome from Dr. Nilesh Kalyana Raman, the Annapolis and Anne Arundel County Health Officer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's been a it's been a year. It's been a year since COVID came to came to our city, county, or state. Um, and and as as Mayor noted, it has changed how we think about how we think about ourselves, how we think about others. We are we are social. We are social beings, um, and and COVID preys on that, and it has forced us to change how we relate and uh, interact with others. Um, and I and I and I agree that the way that we've gotten through this is by pulling together, uh, by looking out for one another, by being kind to each other. And one of the one of the things that I take from this is that we we've, we've blended the science and the humanity, right? We know about this virus. We've learned about this virus. We continue to learn about this virus, but how we actually approach it, it comes from our humanity and how we approach each other. And there have been many people who've gone through hardships, whether because of the virus itself or because of the knockoff effects from it. Um, people have lost their jobs. People have been hungry. Um, people have not been able to see their children their parents, their grandparents, their friends. And now one year later, we are getting close. We are getting close to getting to where we wanna go, which is returning to some sense of normalcy. And it will snap back, right? It's, there was a large period of adjustment. We continue to adjust and we will continue to adjust out of this. And this will be one of those defining moments in, in all of our lives. Um, but we will return to a time where we can be with each other, where we can hug each other. And that time is coming soon, it's coming in the next few months. It's not some sort of nebulous, we'll get there when we get there. It's really coming in the next few months. And so it's good to be here with you today um, to think back on where we were and to look forward to where we will be going. Thank you. And now we'll go to our director of the Office of Emergency Management, Kevin Simmons. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be here this evening. Um, there are certain points in our history that pulled us together and defined us, our strength and resiliency as a nation, as a, as a people. Pearl Harbor and World War II were defining events in my grandfather's time. It earned them the title as the greatest generation. My parents, for my parents, it was the death of John Kennedy and the civil rights movement that had an impact on their times. 
the majority of Americans over 30 knew exactly where they were when the Twin Towers fell in 2001. Then there was the COVID-19 pandemic. The, 20, the 2020 pandemic year has been the biggest story of our time. Most will agree that the year 2020 is the most devastating and disruptive year that most of us have lived through. One year ago, uh, the pandemic had not yet swept the city of Annapolis and we were trying to decide on whether to move forward with our annual St. Patrick's Day parade. We were starting to get used to washing your hands, watching your distance and wearing a mask. Wearing a mask, back then we thought that that was something that we see on the evening news and only affected other countries, not the United States. But we suddenly got a quick lesson. Within a year's time, we become experts on CDC, PPE, PCR versus rapid tests, variant strains, case rates, pop-up testing, super spreader events, and contact tracing. We also had a, a chance to brush up on our math skills, calculating 50% capacities here, 25% capacities there. Today, a year later, we stand at the edge of one of the biggest scientific achievements in history, the development of a safe and effective vaccine within a year's time. The fastest any vaccine has previously been developed from a viral sampling to approval was four years, and that was the mumps in, in the 60s. Through it all, the city of Annapolis pulled together. Sometimes it wasn't pretty, and at times we didn't agree. But in the end, we were resilient because we stayed bonded together and we supported each other as one Annapolis. The more severe pandemic times are behind us and the finish line lies ahead, but let's not forget the 1,053 Annapolitans who caught the virus and the 60 Annapolitans who died from COVID-19 related complications. Thanks for having me here this evening. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Director Simmons. So it was exactly one year ago today that the city of Annapolis uh, shut its doors back on March 12th of 2020. Mayor Buckley called an emergency session of the Annapolis City Council and informed them that he was declaring a state of emergency. A few days later, we got word from Dr. Kalyana Raman that the order was to shut things down. So I'd just like to go back to that time a little bit. And Mayor Buckley, if you could tell us some of your thoughts from those, the earliest days of the pandemic. Thank you, Mitchell. I, I do remember the first thing um, that I thought that the, this wasn't in the application form when I signed up to become mayor. Um, and how many more hard things can they throw at you? Um, but um, I knew this city uh, could handle it and I knew this city would step forward. Um, and I know that we have the right people in place in the city to get us through this. So we uh, initiated um, seven day a week uh, meetings with the command staff. Um, we continued that until we stabilized the situation. But I do remember um, putting out an infomercial with uh, Dr. Kalyana Rahman and he came to our office and uh, you know, I didn't really know what I was, he knew more than I knew of course. Um, I thought, you know, what's well, a month or two or three where we'll be back in business, you know, and we sat down to do an infomercial. And as they were filming it, I leaned over to shake his hand and he's like, that's not going to happen anymore. So um, we weren't shaking hands. We didn't even fist bump then. Uh, or maybe we did. But it was it was it was a, a, a moment that I realized that everything was about to change. And everything that you thought was normal or second nature, you had to think again. Um, and uh, he taught me and uh, he's been teaching me this whole year and we've been learning a lot from uh, from what he's uh, his leadership. And uh, I uh, always remember that kind of funny moment. I'm looking forward to doing a little uh, clip of those moments as we progress. Thank you. Dr. K, uh, can you tell us when COVID first was on your radar? Do you do you recall first learning about it or hearing about it or knowing that it had come to Maryland? Can you? Reminisce on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So thinking back, this was uh, <clears throat> this was the winter of 2019, and it was over the um, it was over the winter holidays, and I was reading um, 
I don't know what I was reading, but I was picking up uh, signs of something happening in China, some virus that's that's going around. And this happens, right? There have been other um, other viral infections that have arisen, and so definitely something to keep your eye on. And then December thirty first, there was an announcement that this was a, there was a viral pandemic, um, and so at that point it became something that was on my tabletop something to keep an eye on. And the real question was how fast would it spread? Um, and I remember that January 20th was the first case in the United States. And it was, I think that was the moment where I said, you know what, it's coming. Because if it's gonna travel across the ocean, it's not gonna be hard for it to travel across the continent. Um, and so actually I remember we were getting more and more information from the CDC, from the state health department, but we were also just following this. And I think it was early to mid February, started briefing, briefing leaders on what was coming down the pike. Um, the, the question wasn't whether it would show up in Maryland, it was simply when and would we have enough time to get ready for it. Uh, and I think what was um, what raised what raised our uh, raised our hair on the back of our necks was how quickly it was moving, and how deadly it was. Right, that's a that's a tough combination. We've seen viruses move fast, and we've seen them be deadly, but they usually don't do the same thing. The last time it's done that was literally a hundred years ago in the flu epidemic of 1918. So really there isn't anybody with a, a good living memory of that moment and what it actually meant at a global level. Other places have had pandemics. So I think it was a bit hard for all of us to really feel that space. We could intellectually in the public health community understand what might be coming, um, but to rewire the entire fabric of our day-to-day -day existence, that's a tough one. But as we as as we started to hear more and more cases, uh, when March came around, I remember um, I remember us at health at the health department at least. We actually went into our emergency operations on March second, um, and we had our first case in Maryland on March fifth. And I remember telling folks we have at most a week before we see our first case in the county. Um, it took six days, and the rest the rest we know. Simmons, over in the, the world of, off, of emergency management, was pandemic something that you anticipated you really had on your radar at all? Or how were you thinking about this? I had it on, kind of had it on my radar after a conversation with Dr. Kaliana Rama, which she probably doesn't even remember. We were at his office for something totally different. And we, I kept hearing about this virus, this virus. And I asked him about it and he was explaining to me about the virus and he said it probably originated from an interaction with an animal and a human being, probably a bat. And I said, okay. And, and within weeks, we, we, were, we were very much into it. So the mayor, he struck a, um, he declared a state of emergency. And when you declare a state of emergency, it requires me by code to do two things. And number one is to coordinate any activities of city departments in all actions to serve and prevent and alleviate any ill effects from the pandemic. And then um, receive any aid, such as response personnel, equipment, facilities to city departments from local, state, and, and the feds. So my biggest concern was to make sure that we could have critical services and prepare our our leadership for the training. So what we did right off the bat, um, we started our COOP planning, our comp continuity of government of operations planning known as COOP. Um, so we got, we met with each uh, department head and we went over their COOP plans um, of the individual city agencies to ensure the primary essential functions of that agency can continue to be performed during a, a wide range of emergencies as the pandemic or anything that could happen within the pandemic. Each department was responsible to have their plans in place to ensure that operations uh, was, was normal as, or as normal as could be. 
The second thing that we looked at was training and making sure that, that everybody could respond. So on March 11th, 2020, a year ago tomorrow, we had a facilitated discussion at uh, 7480 Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard. The training was intended attended by department heads and staff from the Buckley administration and the Pittman administration. The discussion centered around the city and the county's response to an outbreak of COVID-19 at an assisted living facility. At that time, it was thought that those facilities would be the ground zero for the outbreak. So as um, the incident commander of the pandemic, Dr. Kaliana Rahman presided over the training and was co-facilitated by myself and my then counterpart for Anne Arundel County, Tim, Tim Michaels. Um, as, as the mayor alluded to and talked about, the mayor, city manager, and department heads and other, other partners met virtually for seven days a week um, to go over our plan responses, to evaluate their effectiveness, and to make the necessary adjustments when we needed to. Um, it was, <laughs> all in all, I felt good and confident that Annapolis was ready as we could be, given the fact that this was something that we've never seen or experienced before. Great, thank you. Um, mayor Buckley, you did not surely expect to be mayor in a pandemic. So talk a little bit about um, leadership. What were some of the concerns you had for our community? Uh, well, I, I knew um, that this is why you run for office. This is why uh, you need government because you need leadership in these moments because somebody has to take control. And, and I knew we had an excellent uh, director of emergency management, Chief Kevin Simmons, and this moment called for a big bad man. And uh, he stepped up and gave us the structure that we needed to, to have in the city to move forward and had already established the relationships in the county and in the state with the people that we would need to be coordinating with all throughout this pandemic. Um, I remember trying to uh, uh, organize a mayors with masks campaign. Uh, we organized that in in March, April, and we put that um, put that um, notice out to encourage that. We made sure that we put signs throughout our city encouraging, you know, washing your hands, keeping your distance, wearing a mask, and it was challenging. People did not want to uh, cooperate. They did not understand that we would just trying to keep them safe. So we knew that would be parallel, parallel things that we had to concentrate on. First, the health crisis. And we did that um, with, uh, through coordination, uh, obviously with, with our fantastic health department, but we needed to make sure that we could service people that maybe did not have the resources that other people had. So early on, we pushed to take testing, to mobilize our testing, into communities that had less resources than other communities. Uh, I was there on the first mobile testing day in the parole community health center with Dr. K and we ran out of tests within an hour. Uh, and he, he ran back and uh, acquired extra tests. And this is when tests were hard to get your hands on. You have to realize the challenges that we had and the coordination that was involved in trying to get uh, resources, uh, trying to get the things that you needed to to respond to this crazy thing that we, we that we were we dealing with, we knew we knew food insecurity would be a massive challenge. We coordinated um, uh, uh, and watched the community coordinate multiple food drives with, throughout the city. And and you'll hear from us later on how we mobilized the cares team to go into communities to build trust so that we could bring people out so that they would get tested because COVID is the big equalizer. If we did not, or if we do not fix COVID for every person in our community, rich, poor, black, white, Latino, old, young, we, we do not fix COVID. And, and, and we, we use that lens uh, to move forward. Uh, the other parallel track was the economic crisis. We knew that when the shutdown happened from the governor, which was very necessary, um, that, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people would be on the street without a job and without the resources that they need to feed their family, 
um, uh, to, to, to go to a doctor. And, and we, we made sure uh, that those communities knew that we were here for them. And, and I'm very proud that we slowly build up the trust, uh, especially in the Latino community, that they would, could come forward and, and test, even though there might be three or four police cars in a, in a, in a situation. So it was a really um, a great moment for me. On the business front, we uh, went into the five business precincts in the city and did uh, a thing we called curbside chats. And we let the business owners come out of their businesses onto the streets and talk about what they needed and what we were gonna try to provide for them. Um, from that, we developed, from that listening session, we developed a small business recovery task force. And um, uh, uh, for any of you that know a little bit about politics, um, everything can get politicized. So I made sure that we had someone that you couldn't uh, politicize, and that is a man called Dick Franio, head up our small business recovery task force. He is the owner of the Boatyard and Grill, and everybody loves him, Democrat or Republican. He led us through this with, um, in partnership with um, uh, our amazing economic development office manager, uh, Stephen Rice. Um, we, through that organization, and Stephen will tell you a little bit more about this, we organized recovery zones. We organized events that were safe and we kept people out of the restaurants and out of the business for as long as we needed to, to make sure that they're in a safer environment to, um, uh, to keep our economy running. Because you have to understand the jobs that are created by these small businesses are the lifeblood of, of so many um, of, uh, of so many of us. And so we, uh, we, when we had to make sure that there was a trickle of money getting to people while we got them to the resources that were coming to us on a county and a federal level. Um, and I would like to thank um, Dick Franio and I'd like to hand it over to Stephen Rice to let him elaborate uh, to you on all the efforts that he made and his office made to get us through the pandemic. Stephen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. The, uh, this time last year, it seemed like the sky was falling. Uh, and, you know, it was a scary time for uh, obviously the business community, but uh, for government leaders as well. And, you know, the, I think the, the Small Business Recovery Task Force uh, got its authorization in uh, April of last year. And we got to work right away. Um, you know, our charge was to come up with recommendations to help the business community uh, make it through the crisis. We looked at the short term, the medium and the long term. Um, we wanted to have an, an immediate impact, but we also wanted to think strategically and in a longitudinal kind of way. Um, and we, we really got going in uh, May of last year, and we were a couple of weeks into the task force uh, operations and our analysis and our assessments and uh, our, our meetings with different uh, groups and sectors and so forth. And, and the mayor actually uh, decided that we needed to have a citywide dining under the stars uh, event, and he gave us uh, 10 days to do it. <laughs> and uh, as, as we all know, the mayor is a force of nature, and uh, it drove many of us uh, batty, but to his credit, we were able to pull it off. He believed in us when we didn't believe in ourselves, and uh, this event was really an opportunity to uh, showcase the fact that Annapolis was still open for business, although in a different uh, way and in a safe uh, socially distanced kind of way, uh, but also it was an opportunity to, particularly for restaurants and retailers, give them the chance to uh, spread out and with social distancing requirements, uh, this gave them a larger capacity and a larger footprint. And they were able to move into parking spaces, sidewalks, into the street with their uh, food and their wares. And this uh, model was the uh, model that in large part we use for the recovery zones. 
And so the recovery zones that the Small Business Recovery Task Force eventually rolled out and made a formal recommendation to the city uh, to implement were, were really modeled in large part off of this uh, city, excuse me, citywide Dining Under the Stars event. So the, the Small Business Recovery Task Force, we did a couple of things. Um, the first thing we did was to do a citywide business survey to get a sense of where businesses were concerned, uh, where they were scared, what their uh, immediate issues and needs were. And we wanted to see if there was a way for us to uh, service those needs. Um, and actually, based upon the results of the survey, it was very clear that uh, the small businesses didn't have a lot of information about the Small Business Administration programs. They wanted some assistance. They needed some financial counseling and advice. Um, they needed someone to walk them through uh, the process, the loan process and the grant processes. And so we actually uh, engaged a gentleman by the name of Patrick Sherney, who we brought on to provide workshops at no charge for uh, small businesses in Annapolis. And uh, Mr. Sherney did a series of workshops. Uh, those that were not able to attend the workshops could pull them up online and you know, get the value of the information that was shared. He walked businesses through the application processes. He provided technical assistance and uh, reached almost 50 businesses just doing that uh, through, through, through the workshops. And what we also did was we, the Small Business Recovery Task Force had 50 members who were business leaders from all walks of uh, Annapolis economic life. And um, we had a lot of expertise. We had some accountants, we had some bankers, we had people who had skills who, and they were willing and able to, to use those skills on behalf of helping the small businesses. So um, we formed a business advisory committee and this committee at no charge uh, enabled small businesses to sign up, uh, identify what sort of expertise or help that they needed and they would receive free one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. Uh, the business advisory committee technically is still in operation and uh, at last count they have um, counseled 81 businesses. So, uh, you know, this was the immediate, you know, uh, impact of the task force stepping up, you know, the, the business advisory committee, uh, engaging Mr. Sherney to provide some direct counseling and surveying the businesses to find out exactly what they needed. Then we moved on to, you know, some more kind of meat and potatoes. Um, we had uh, a series of, we, we called them industry calls with the mayor, where we would bring in uh, experts of the various industries. We had a, a retail industry call. We had a couple of restaurant industry calls. Uh, the task force, we had a, a maritime industry call um, and nonprofit industry call. Each committee of the task force had at least one industry call. And the goal was to come up with best practices for the industry within the COVID uh, environment. And you know, understanding COVID is here, how do we calibrate so that we can still be successful within this framework? And so we put out uh, and shared best practices for each of these industries so that they could uh, essentially take this information as a boilerplate and implement it in, in order to, to be successful. Uh, we also, I think we launched nine different resource pages on the uh, Task Force and Economic Development website uh, to provide information and access to resources from the local, state, and federal uh, partners. And we, the, the Task Force in, in the end, in July 1st uh, of last year, provided 83 recommendations uh, to the city that we thought if implemented would uh, help the small business community make it through the COVID crisis uh, and be successful at, at the end. So we were extremely busy uh, and, you know, but the, the biggest and probably the most impactful thing was the recommendation to do the re recovery zones um, that, you know, are still in operation today. If folks would like to participate in what you've got going on moving forward, is there still opportunity for that? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the uh, Small Business Recovery Task Force page uh, is up and running. The Economic Development page on the city website is up and running. running. My contact information is, is there, as is uh, Hope Stewart's contact information, my colleague. And anything we can do to help small businesses, uh, that's what we're here to do. Perfect. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Mayor Buckley also talked a little bit about health disparities, and I'd like to go ahead and throw it now to Laura Gutierrez from the mayor's office to talk about some of the things she worked on. Hey, thank you, Mitchell, and thank you, Mayor, for inviting me on this panel and everybody here for participating equally in this panel. It's been great to, to share space with you all. Um, so I just wanted to sort of talk about our health equity initiatives in the city of Annapolis. So under our, the leadership of our mayor, um, we really had a bunch of conversations to talk specifically about how do we reach into our hardest hit communities in Annapolis and what do we do to get um, resources out to keep our community healthy and to reduce the impact of COVID on, on our hardest hit communities, which um, you know we're showing to be the Hispanic and African-American community. So, um, one of the first initiatives that we worked on was um, basically creating a program called Take Care Annapolis or Cuidate Annapolis, where we had two target communities working with our Hispanic and African American communities and basically um, canvassing our neighborhoods, going door to door, speaking to our neighbors about concerns and, and, and working in health education and outreach as we were doing that. So the important part of our work was really not only were we speaking to each neighbor about what was going on in their, you know, current in that time in as we walked each neighborhood, but also um, sharing information about what was going on with COVID, how to get tested, um, you know, how even testing evolved throughout the year. I think um, at the beginning everybody was so scared of getting tested, and and by the end now it's it's just it's just completely changed what testing is like since, since uh, COVID began. I don't know if you guys remember those <laughs> really uh, intense nose swabs that we used to get and now you barely feel it. Um, so it, we talked about all of that with our neighbors. We, we explained what, why we had to do the nose swabs, why we should be getting tested, why it was important to wear masks. Um, and we made sure to share those, that PPE also. So the protective equipment, uh, so face masks, hand sanitizers, soaps, we even handed out laundry detergent um, <laughs> at each home. I think um, between both teams, we actually handed out around 6,000 kits to homes to our neighbors. Um, and we continue to do that to this day. And, and we're continuing to bring that in um, you know, on a weekly basis. We keep canvassing neighborhoods. And <clears throat> another important part of our work was to do a community needs assessment. So. And, and we had one initial survey, but then we continued to do different sort of questionnaires about different topics, learning about what were the concerns around COVID, you know, what were our neighbors thinking about, um, you know, what, what it meant, how you could spread COVID, um, what testing actually would do to you, um, what a vaccine could do, what are the worries and concerns around vaccinations. And so that actually gave us a lot of feedback that we would take back to meetings with community partners, community organizations, um, you know, all our, all our teammates at the mayor's office. And we would discuss what, what should we do with, you know, if, if, if our neighbors are feeling this way, then what's the messaging we need to be creating so that we all understand what the actual situation is. So if there is one myth going around, we need to be talking about that myth right now. And so that was sort of our approach. Um, it was very much about neighborhood up. Um, so learning about what is our neighbor saying today and how do we act on that tomorrow? Um, and getting and just working on that um, day to day. Um, and I would say really, it, as we worked with our mayor and, and made sure that he you know, was up to date on everything that was going on, that was also a great feedback loop in terms of learning um, what we needed to be taking back as well and what new resources were available. So for example, um, Wi-Fi was a huge issue in, our, in, in these communities and quickly our mayor acted to bring Wi-Fi into the communities. Um, so, so it was, you know, our, our work I think has been really important in terms of making sure that we are on the ground talking to each, each neighbor, each, um, you know, 
community partner and making sure that we are all involved and working together to fight COVID. Um, and I don't want to take up too much more time, so I will I will leave it at that. And if there's any questions, we can come back later. Um, now we want to talk about moving forward. We've got a lot of pathways to move forward, but um, and I know the mayor has talked about this on our citywide COVID calls. Uh, mayor, would you like to talk a little bit about vaccinations? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I do want to point out, um, you know, what an amazing job um, the CARES team and Laura and Tola have done, and uh, how um, you know we have taken the resources to the people and not expected the people to come to us. So today I was with uh, Oddwan Pindell Charles in, in, in the Mount Olive Church, uh, where we, we set up a vaccination site uh, and, and, and people could see in their community that this was a safe thing to do. Um, and so, uh, and tomorrow we'll be um, uh, in uh, uh, the church, I forgot the name of it, sorry. Um, uh, we'll be in, uh, what, which one is that, Laura, sorry? Iglesia Emanuel. Emanuel, yeah, okay, that Emmanuel Church um, in uh, Admiral Heights uh, for for the community there to go to a safe place to go somewhere they 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 feel uh, that they that they know and and that's been through um, the efforts um, uh, of this team um, and and also um, I always talk about the food drives how um, how many people started a food drive out of the back of their minivan. Um, or how uh, Pastor Menendez teamed up with Director Simmons to make sure that we facilitated these massive mile-long queues of food drives. There was the one thing it demonstrated was the need in, in our community. And um, I was so proud to be part of some of those um, food drives and, and, and really uh, feel it. And, and I want to say that th this city showed up during this pandemic. I mean, when Laura talks about being in the field, she was in the field. It was not questioned whether you're gonna expose yourself, whether you're taking a risk. Everybody stepped forward and, and, and didn't think about their own, their own situation. They followed the right practices, but they were on the ground. And I wanna say, thank you. Um, and now we have a light at the end of the tunnel. Now we have um, uh, the vaccines on the way. Uh, we have encouraging news. Uh, coming from Washington, D.C., about the volume of, of vaccines. Um, you know, I know uh, Dr. Kalyana Raman is as frustrated as all of us about supply. I mean, he could have vaccinated two times as many, three times as many people if he'd been given the opportunity to do that. We all want to do, get vaccines in arms. Um, I think that it's going to uh, accelerate in the next few weeks. Um, so we are, we are putting the infrastructure in place. Um, uh, there is a Pitt Moyer Center that's going to become come online. Obviously, uh, the Naval Academy Stadium is going to be the big one uh, when we have the supply that will come online. And then there will be, a, a, I believe, a flood uh, of vaccines available to the public. Um, but slowly to make sure that we did it, did it in a way that the community could see it was safe. Um, that they could see people that looked like them getting vaccinated and um, and and they uh, they survived or or that that's that trust needed to be worked. You don't you have to earn that trust. Um, uh, this team has 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 earned that trust, um, and I know um, that the next testing site that comes to your community, you you can trust that uh, that it is going to deliver that vaccine into your arm, and that we're going to get onto the next stage in this city and, and help heal. So Dr. K and Director Simmons, would you two like to talk about what we have in store for Annapolis in terms of vaccines and vaccination clinics and where we are in the priority list? Sure, we'll give it a start and then uh, pitch it over to Kevin. Um, as the mayor noted, we want more vaccines. I think that's been the toughest part of this, right? There's a, there's a, a lot of people want it. There just isn't enough yet. And I think some of that is just because it's a new thing. We've moved faster on this vaccine than anything else pretty much ever in, 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 in terms of vaccines. Um, and that means that those companies are ramping up production. So we have the capacity 
as a health department, but more importantly, there's a lot more capacity. So doctor's offices haven't really had a chance yet to get their hands on vaccine. The hospitals have additional capacity. No Anne Arundel Medical Center does. We talk to them nearly every day about this. Um, pharmacies, there's, there's a number of them in the county that have them, but there are more that could. Um, mass vaccination sites, and, and the mayor mentioned um, uh, Navy Stadium, amongst others, there's capacity. So I think what's made it hard during this time is that there's so much promise. And for, for many people, it's just, just beyond their reach. And that makes it even more frustrating sometimes. Um, and so, you know, appreciate everybody's patience. And it's hard to be patient, but patience. And as we move through these priorities, right? And we have these priorities because we wanted to identify those with either high individual risk, so people who would have pretty bad outcomes, right, if they if they got COVID, or people with high occupational exposure. And that's why we started with healthcare workers and our public safety first responders like fire and police and EMS, um, because those groups are they get put into situations they don't control it, and actually our you know our healthcare workers are meant to take care of people with COVID. Um, and then our next group, um, sorry, and, and then the individual risk were people in nursing homes who we know were hit amazingly hard by this, by this pandemic. Um, next step was getting folks in assisted living facilities, independent living, um, educators, people over the age of 75, people in homeless shelters, um, people who either have high individual risk or once again, educators who are in a situation who um, have a lot of people in that space. And we think that education is important, right? As a country we do, as a, as a city we do. Um, and that's why we're moving down this priority list. One of the things that we get a lot of questions about is why is the county in this phase, but the, the state's in this phase. And we've really made it our principle that we are not going to leave anybody behind as a health department. We are here for every single person in this city and in this county. And so while, while the state was in 1C, we were in 1B up until yesterday, actually. We moved into the 1C 65 to 74 category. But we did that after we had given every 75-year-old who had registered a chance. Now, not all of them are vaccinated yet, but we've given every one of them a chance. We're giving every educator a chance. We're kind of the, we think of ourselves as the sweeper. We're going to get everybody who's vulnerable. That's why we've started our community clinics to vaccinate with the faith, in partnership with the faith, our faith organizations. We had Mount Olive, we'll have more. Um, that's why we've been talking to the hospital about this. That's why we're going to be in Pitt Moyer. It's, more, it's far more important for us to have a smaller site that's accessible to the community than a larger site, which requires driving, right? If you can drive to the stadium, you can drive another 10 minutes to another site. It's far more important to be embedded into our communities. And so we're keyed up to get more doses, to coordinate more doses, to really push through what we expect to come in April. Um, I'll hand it over to Kevin to, to talk about talk about what this looks like from his side. Director Simmons, you're muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in the city of Annapolis is we wanted to make sure because of mobility issues that we had sites in the city of Annapolis that folks could get to where they didn't have to drive to the sites in the county. So when the health department and Luminous, a part of the, the hospital staff, uh, announced the fact that they were going to do these, these pop-up clinics in the city of Annapolis, I was ecstatic. And I can actually see how that is working and supporting the city of Annapolis. Now, we, we first started out with Morris Blum and Morris Blum, we were able to go into Morris Blum. Uh, primarily that was luminous with support from the health department. We were able to do well over a hundred folks. Um, Asbury Church, which was yesterday on West Street, we did 140, we did 140. Bloomsbury Square, we went to Mount Olive Church. I don't know the results today, but I could tell you it was a line going out of out the door. 
So, um, and I know Mount Zion, Mount Zion is this coming Saturday. So these pop-up community clinics are having an impact. A couple of weeks ago, I looked at the numbers, I looked at the data in the city of Annapolis, it was about um, totally Annapolis with our 40,000 or so population. We had about 89, we had about 88,900 uh, total vaccinations. And today I received the data, so we're, we're up considerably. We have 12,505 total vaccinations of that 7,824 first doses and 4,681 are second doses. Now, how does, how does that pair with race and ethnicity? Um, and I'll just, just go by the, the top three, which is white, black, and Hispanic. Um, for vaccinations for our white citizens, it's 5,353. African American is 1,402, and Hispanic is 261. So we have a ways to go. I'm very encouraged about the pop up community clinics. Um, I, I've seen a, a massive jump in the last two weeks, and I expect to see more. I'm encouraged about the talks that we have going on about the stadium. Um, it's just like Dr. Kali Raman says is right now um, supplies what's holding us back. So, thank you. Director Simmons, can you tell residents who might be watching how they can sign up for Pip Moyer? Are they, do they, do we have a sign up for that yet or where will it be available when it is ready? So right now we're still trying to work out the details. Our dry run is going, since we just went into 1C, our dry run, which will be March 26th, will be our essential employees. And after we work out the bugs, what we'll do is we'll advertise and let everyone know how they can sign up and, and be a part of that Pitt Moyer Vax Clinic. Will that be through the Department of Health or through the city? It would, no? be, it would be both, Dr. Kalyana Rama, wouldn't it, sir? That a, so the, the Pitt Moyer registrations, will the, those will be another option for people when they go through the County Health Department to sign up, yep. you'll see that there is an option. Okay. Both places. Great, if you have questions, you can put them in the Facebook uh, comments and we will get to them. We have one question. This is probably for Dr. K. Uh, when we initially heard about COVID, we heard that the death toll was gonna be over 2 million people. And we are at a quite significant, more than 500,000 people, but um, why is that number not as bad as it was made out to be in the beginning? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. And so I think that gets to the core of public health is to prevent those things from happening. Um, if you think about all the changes we went through, um, we had to stay at home for a number of months, limited activities, masking, which is really critical actually. Um, that's how we kept it down. But to give you a sense of scale with essentially changing how we operate, um, we had in the county over 500 deaths. We're now at 539, just a couple of days over a year. To put that into scale in a, in a regular year, we see about 1,000 deaths from heart disease and about 1,000 from cancer. And then that would make COVID the third deadliest disease. And it required this level of effort to prevent it from being larger. So another piece, when you look at our flu and you look at our flu admissions to the hospital, it's nearly zero, <laughs> nearly zero. And that's a consequence of all the activity that we put into place, or sorry, all the limited activity we put into place, the masking. And despite that, COVID is still hospitalizing people. So I think that's a demonstration of how potent it is and why we needed this response. Um, this is probably either for Mayor Buckley or for Stephen Rice. Are there pieces of the recovery zones that we'll keep even when COVID goes away? I'd like to answer that, um, obviously. Um, you know, I, I always have wanted to orient our city outdoors. We live in a beautiful city that should be 
enjoyed um, from the sidewalk or, or from a parklet. Um, there is an upside to COVID. Uh, we, we have uh, walked more, we have biked more, we have discovered green spaces that we never even knew we had. We've spent time with our families, indoors and outdoors. And so I wanna continue that. And there is a big appetite for people, uh, for the business community to keep um, some of the recovery zones in place. We have to do some modifications and it's obviously part of our future plan for the city doc reimagined. Um, but I'm really encouraged by this being pushed forward by the business community. And so, you know, uh, an expanded sidewalk um, will, will be a, a better option for some people than a parking space. Um, and so I've always said in Annapolis, we have more of a, a walking problem than a parking problem. We have a lot of parking. It's just not exactly in front of the business you want to go to at exactly that minute. But if you have to walk a little bit, it's still worth the walk. We have a beautiful outdoor um, city and um, this will only uh, mean that we'll appreciate it more and uh, looking forward to working with people um, on, um, on how we create those spaces. And as our Rec and Parks folks can tell us, people did get used to walking during the pandemic. Our parks were more used probably than ever. Um, we have another question for Dr. K. Have the treatments for patients that are hospitalized with COVID improved since last year? They have. Um, so a couple of things have improved since last year. One, hospitals have learned what supportive measures to take to, uh, to care for people with COVID in the hospital. Um, and then we also do have new treatments, which are uh, which do um, do help people. So the monoclonal antibodies that you may have heard of, um, remdesivir, um, those are treatments that if you give them early enough can decrease the severity of the, of the infection and actually of your inflammatory response and improve recovery and survival. More questions for you, Dr. K. We're gonna call this the lightning round. Let's do it. When can we go to a wedding or a family gathering without a mask? Good question. So right now, um, as people are getting vaccinated, people who are vaccinated can be maskless with others who are vac vaccinated in their household. We're really waiting for a few more months to get enough people vaccinated so we can do things like go to weddings, go to parties, go to all sorts of things. So give it a few more months and we'll be there. When can healthcare workers get back to their regular routines and schedules? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, well, health, as healthcare workers, you should have had the opportunity to be vaccinated, right? At this point, you're really trying to keep all your patients safe so that they don't get sick from other patients. So same, same answer, pretty much. Once we get a critical mass vaccinated, we'll be able to return to more normal schedules. Do you think we'll ever be greeting our friends and family members with, you know, handshakes and hugs and, you know, kisses on either cheek? Or will we, will we be leery from here on out, do you think? We can and we should do that. I think some people, it'll take an adjustment, right? We, we spent a year not doing that. And so it's going to feel a little weird to do that again. But I think we'll, we'll slip into our old habits pretty quickly. I already know some people here in the city who still want to hug. <laughs> um, do you think we'll keep doctor uh, virtual appointments? Do you think some of those things that have that were born out of COVID will will linger around for our healthcare community? Yeah, I think telehealth is a really great example. Um, both the video and the audio pieces; those are things we've been talking about for a long time. COVID forced the issue, and they're a fantastic option for many, not for everybody. So I think the future is really having a hybrid. Talk about hybrid in a lot of spaces, but having a mix of in-person and telehealth. Same with business meetings, then I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> and when do you think kids will be back in school regularly in, in the county? Do you feel like that's in the fall, that that's, that's likely? That's most likely in the fall, yes. Um, just there isn't enough time, I think, in the remainder of this school year to adapt to the changing dynamics of vaccinations, but I think over the summer we'll have time and in the fall we'll be pretty close to normal. So there's basically, we're looking at continuing the 
fall semester, not, no, not, not going to year-round schooling or anything like that. There's no conversations like that happening. That's a that's a conversation that's that's beyond me at this point. That's up to more the the state board of education. Um, yeah. I, I'll I'll leave aside my issues with the agrarian school calendar for a later day. All right. Well, I don't think we have any other questions. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank all of our panelists for bringing their A game tonight, and um, I look forward to getting my vaccine and getting back out into the world. Thanks. Have a good night. Can I, I just night, want to everyone. say one thing. Can I just say one thing to Annapolis? Um, make no mistake, um, the people who are watching us and the people in this city, you saved lives. You, you kept people safe. I want to thank you for staying home. I want to thank you for washing your hands and keeping your distance and wearing a mask because you really, truly saved lives. We can't underestimate that. If we had done nothing, thousands more people, hundreds of thousands, whatever measure you use of people would have died. And because of you, we are a safer community. So I really want to stress that and, and just say with all my heart that we, we, we thank you and keep it up till we get a few more months into it. Thank you all. Good night, everyone.